It's now my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Tim Smith. He's founder and CEO of Wiglaf Pricing, which supports startups through Fortune 500 companies through consulting, training, books, and other media. In addition, he's an adjunct professor of marketing at DePaul University, academic advisor to the PPS Certified Pricing Professional Program, and author of multiple works, including Pricing Done Right. So with that, Tim, welcome. Well, welcome. I'm great to great to be here. Great to have you uh, listen in. Let's talk about sales performance enhancement by selling value. Let's go back. There we go. Uh, sell value, not offerings. That's the that's the focus of this particular talk right here. A uh, bit of background on myself. I've written four books on pricing. I've served cl many clients in life sciences, IT, manufacturing distribution, other areas. Been in the news a bit uh, on radio, in the papers. Been able to serve customers around the globe. There we go, back there. Serve customers around the globe, mostly in the US and Europe, a bit of Latin America, even down in Australia. And you may know me because I have 450,000 followers there on LinkedIn. People often ask me, how did I get so many followers? Answer's kind of simple. I wrote things that they wanted to read. That's the way to do it. Click. All right. So question mark Rockman said, are you legit? We basically said I am legit. So what do I got to show you? Well, first of all, let's take a look at some of the things that great people in sales have been selling, have been telling us. Neil Rackham came out with a book a long time ago called Spend Selling. Spend stood for situation, problem, implications, needs, payoff. Notice that last term, needs, payoff. The end of the sales cycle where you start, you're driving the close, you have to understand and define their needs and show them the payoff of buying your solution. So, so the whole focus was on understanding and uncovering what customers care about and then show them how your solution delivers to their needs. So that's a solution plus a whiff them. What's in it for me? Now, how do you show them that? Well, that's where you show the economic value to customer. Let's try that. Take a look at another group, Miller Hyman. Miller Hyman is probably one of the largest sales training companies on the planet. And when Miller Hyman talks about relationships with customers, they talk about relationship alignment. And they say in their book, page 20, really early on, relationship alignment is a critical feature of large account selection for only those relationships whose value is recognized by both seller, supplier, and customer are truly sustainable. Notice those words in there, selection. You're choosing who to sell to, who you want to work with. And it's about value, mutual value growth from that relationship. That value growth enables that relationship to move forward. And that's a sustainable relationship. Take a look at a newer book, The Challenger Sale, coming out, written by Matthew Dixon few little quotes out of his book. What sets the best suppliers apart is not the quality of the products, but the value of their insight. New ideas to help customers either make money or save money in ways they didn't even know were possible. Or later on in the book, customers aren't looking for reps to anticipate or discover needs they already know they have, but rather to teach them about the opportunities to make or save money they didn't even know were possible. Reed Holden, Reed Holden, really nice guy, wrote a couple of books. One of them is Negotiating with Backbone. And here's some quotes from Reed Holden. Value is the basis of business exchange. You provide products and services to customers so they can build their own value. In exchange, they take part of that value you help them build and return it to you in the form of price. That's the way business is supposed to work. Here's the million-dollar question. Do you understand your value, the value you provide 
for your customers? Or elsewhere, he writes, how does the customer get financial value from the use of your offering? The trick is to drive the discussion to a dollar sign. If you can't focus on the financial value, any talk about value to the customer is just noise. You have nothing to back up the talk. Just yammer, yammer, yammer. Or elsewhere, the solution is to develop sales tools that use the customer's own data. The analysis should provide explicit consideration of competitive alternatives. The objective is to make the customer's purchase decision easier, not harder, by hiding information from them. All these great leaders in sales just keep telling you selling is about value, and we need to focus on that financial value. And I'm talking about you're going to reduce costs, save them time, fewer inputs, less wastage, reduce the labor. Are you going to increase the revenue by improving their ability to capture a higher price, sell in higher volume? Any way to deliver profits from a combination of the above. That's what selling is about, is what they're all saying. Or in my words, if the customer doesn't perceive and acknowledge the value, the value doesn't exist. It's our job to enable that customer to perceive and acknowledge that value. Or else we aren't delivering any value. It's all in the mind, eye of the beholder, and the beholder, the person in charge of determining if there's value is the customer. The customer is royalty. They're the aristocrats in this relationship, and we are serving them. All right, question mark, Rockman, got it. You got it, sell value, got it. We keep seeing this. How do we actually get it done? Okay, well, let's get it done let's take a look at a purchasing decision and purchasing committees have been described in many ways and one of the ways we describe them is to talk about users people actually use the product they could be an engineering a process manager or product manager or something of that nature procurement we all hit procurement the supply chain manager the economic buyer some people say they're a myth other times we actually hit economic buyers who are making decisions about trade-offs and profits and how this is gonna help their business. We have gatekeepers. Always be nice to a gatekeeper. They're the ones that can kick you out. Influencers out there trying to, they have a different idea and they're influencing the decisions. Uh, we have support people. We have visionaries who have a vision of how the business is gonna go and your job is to help them show how your product helps deliver that vision. And yes, there's a competitor. There's always a competitor trying to win that piece to deal from you. The F screeners and purchasers, there are many individuals involved in the purchasing decision. Not all of them are going to care about the valueful communication, but some will. And I want to focus on three of those. Specifically, I want to focus on, there we go. Whoops. One too many. The end user, the person actually using the product or will be using the service and the product or the product. And what are they looking for? They're, they're looking for that offering that helps them do their job better, that helps them perform their business role better. They are going to be very sensitive to the value and the benefits of the offering being delivered. They have the power to say, yes, I want this. Sometimes, though, they're forced to get something they don't want. So they don't necessarily have the power to say no, is how some people would say it. Then we have procurement. Procurement, supply chain, they're going to try to screen out offerings early on that don't make sense based upon the applicability to that business. They'll be very, very price sensitive. I think we all know this very well. And it's been said by some that they have the power to say no, but they don't necessarily have the power to say yes. Then we have this economic buyer. Now, the economic buyer, they're charged with making trade-offs, trade-offs of value and the price they're going to be willing to pay. 
they're the ones that are releasing the funds. They're releasing, they're responsible for the financial impact of this offering. Now, in trying to create your business case to buy your offering, you're going to need to reach that end user because that end user is the one that's going to be able to best help develop that business case of why it is your offering should deliver superior value to that customer. You're going to need to communicate that value offering to procurement so that they can, because they're going to have a scoring mechanism that will be there. And if you know you're going to be hitting that scoring mechanism, you might as well try to make sure that the right things and you're scored correctly or well. And by showing that procurement the value, they'll understand what they're missing in their scoring mechanism and they may improve it. And that economic buyer, if it all means, if you can get to that person, they need to see the value on the table. And that's what we're talking about. Why do I want to include all of those people? Because to drive a sale, especially a complex sale, we have to create an alignment. Alignment within their organization that you are the right offering. You are delivering the right products and services to that customer. All these different roles, they'll each have their own perspective. We can use, you can use economic value to customer to create alignment between these different perspectives and make the sale easier for them to buy. Okay, so here's what an economic value to customer looks like in case you've never seen it. You may have a, a picture here of the price of the alternative, so it's well cleared as to exactly who you're competing with. And you have an idea, you never rarely do you have the exact price, but you have an idea of the price that they're offering. You may have some extra benefits. I call them benefit A, B, and C. And they increase the value you're delivering to that customer. You may be missing something. I'm calling it D. So you're missing benefit D. And that subtracts away some of the value you could be delivering to the customer. You add up the positives, you subtract the negatives, you include the competitor that you're trying to displace, and the whole thing becomes the economic value of the customer. That's the value of your offering to that customer. There's the full picture. Unfortunately, there may be a price buyer, and a price buyer is going to look at everything saying it's the same. That's going to be a hard sell to make. Reed Holden would say, don't even bother with them. Yeah. Okay, there's times when you might want to bother with them. On the alternative, there may be a value buyer, and that value buyer perhaps didn't care about C and also didn't care about D. And that value buyer is going to see a lot more value in the offering, and they're willing to buy it. So the trick is to actually create these value calculators, what I called them many years ago, the economic value to customer picture specific for that customer to enable that customer to see what they care about and how it actually adds value to that customer. Question: Here's an idea that came out of Northwestern uh, where they're talking about benefits and value. And they tried to classify benefits and value in two areas. Aligned, where you say you have it and the customer says you have it, and we are agreeing that the that, that piece of value is there. Boom, is there. And then the contested. And there may be some benefits that the customer think you lack, and you are therefore worse than your competitors, but you have evidence that supports your equal. So you need to present that evidence so that they say, ah. Yep, you're not missing that one. You're in the you're in the ballpark. Go forward. Still got apples to apples. And then finally, benefits that customers think your competitors have, and you are therefore equal to your competitors, but you have evidence that indicate that you're better. Boom, you're not an apple. Now you're a pear. You're better than an apple. I like apples, I like pears. Please don't take that too seriously. But, but point out that you are not the same as an apple-to-apple -apple comparison. You're different. You're better. You have more value being delivered to that table. Question mark, Rockman. He's always 
coming at me. Now he's saying that I'm giving them platitudes. He wants an actual example. Whew. Okay, question mark rock man, you asked for it. I'll give you an example. This came out in 2005. GE released an Evolution Series locomotive. Now, the Evolution Series locomotive was revolutionary at the time. It was going to deliver revolutionary fuel savings over the lifetime of use. It was estimated that the annual fuel, fuel savings could reach a million gallons per year if used continuously. At the time of its release, GE really had its own locomotives they were selling. They were also competing. And I'm going to just put those locomotives and say they were about $2 million. This is a case study, so the numbers are not perfect, okay? Are not exactly correct, but it makes it easy to do the math. Make some assumptions. Diesel, priced around $1.50 a gallon. Customers like Union Pacific and, and BNSF would use their locomotives for 25, 50 years. Let's just assume 25 for the sake of this argument. And while a locomotive is great, some of the times the locomotive is sitting in the station. It's not actually doing anything. So let's assume that the locomotive is only being operated on average 50% of the time. Some customers may use it more, others less. Also assume that there are additional maintenance costs of $200,000 per year. Given these assumptions and a discount rate, a hurdle rate for investment of 12%, calculate the value to the customer. Well, notice what I'm starting with. I have a clear value proposition. I clearly understand what I'm competing with, sort of. I clearly understand how I'm better, I'm going to save fuel, and how I'm worse. There's maintenance costs associated with this new approach. Let's put the picture together in a way that can be communicated to the buying committee to the buying group, to the buying decision makers. So to clarify, we got some benefits. Fuel savings, that's a positive differential value. Maintenance cost, that's a negative differential value. These are financial. These are financially related. Fuel savings, we can describe this clearly. And I like describing things in words. Many people don't like numbers. They much less like math. So put it in words, plain English or Spanish or Polish, whatever language you speak, so that the customer can actually understand what you're delivering. Here it is. In the past, railroad operators had to burn a lot of diesel for locomotives. With the GE Evolution Series, operators can reduce their fuel consumption. This delivers a greener company and fuel cost savings. Notice what I did. I stated, here's the other, here's with us. Clearly different. Here's what you knew in the past. Here's how I'm changing your future. They're different. Clear, competitive, alternative, and value differential value statement put right there. I have impacts. One of them is financial, fuel savings. Boom, I can calculate that. Another one is emotional. There is a good and reason why companies are going for green uh, approaches to the market. They're going for sustainability initiatives. These are all important. Let's show them the money. That will drive the decision. So let's go ahead and calculate the part that we can, the financial impact. So we have a, a worked example of how this is going to work. You can imagine, what's the, here, here we're going. What, what is the maximum potential fuel savings per year in gallons? It came out to a million. That was research based upon their, their studies of how this new locomotive will save fuel. What is the cost of fuel per consumption? We type in $1.50. Again, that's research. That's the forecasted cost of fuel over the period of lifetime of this car, of this uh, locomotive, or the current fuel price. What is the portion of the year that we expect a railroad company, on average, to operate a typical locomotive? We estimated at 50%. That number can come directly from a customer. 
We don't have to just guess. We can get it from the customer by asking them, how often do you run your locomotives? How often are they idle? We can calculate the differential value for one year. Just multiply the above. 50% of a million times 1.5 makes times $1.50 makes it $750,000. Yet it's not a one-year purchase. It's a 25-year purchase. It has a long lifetime. And some operators keep these trains for 50 years. So let's go ahead and find the value over the lifetime of the, of the locomotive. Assuming a 12% discount rate, where do we get that? Again, ask the customer or read their financial reports. We can then go ahead and do some math, do that in the background. And you could say, okay, it's about a four. I need to multiply the savings in one year by a factor of four to get the savings over the 25-year lifespan. Do that, I got about $3.3 million. Excellent. That's the differential value over the lifetime of fuel savings. Very mathematics. You see some of the numbers are customer specific. Other numbers are research that are coming out of your studies, or maybe they're even coming out of academic studies. Next part, maintenance cost. There are extra maintenance costs with this GE locomotive because you have to buy fancy whirly wigs to keep it running. So in the past, railroad operators could use standard parts for repair and maintenance. In the future, with the GE Evolution Series locomotive, operators must purchase proprietary parts from GE at an expected incremental cost of $200,000 per year. Mm. So there's a clear financial impact, and that's the maintenance cost. There's also an emotional impact of vendor lock-in. Not going to calculate that emotional impact, but I am going to be aware of it. And I'm going to try to reduce that emotional strain on making my customer purchase from me. Let's go for the math of the maintenance cost. Incremental value of the maintenance cost, 200,000. It's negative. Differential value in one year. In year one, 200,000. Same 25-year lifespan. Discount rate, and I can calculate the differential value for over the lifetime. It's a negative eight hundred thousand dollars. Now I got the two parts. Let's put it together. You see, I start out with the competitive price, two hundred thousand dollars. I add in the three million dollars of fuel savings. I subtract off the eight hundred thousand dollars of maintenance cost, and my economic value to this to this customer on average is about four point two million. Pricing comes in, that's where I usually work, and it says, okay, out of that savings and value, we're going to share some of that with the customer. I would like to share $1 million of the value we're creating with the customers and capture the other million dollars. So I'm going to ask for $3.1 million. That's a winning price of 3.103 with some change. 3.1, that's the price we're going to go. We have a price, we have a value story, but this is still at the market level. I need to focus on a customer. I hear you, it's coming. We need to consider how the economic value to the customer changes with different customers. So we can change those parameters given feedback from the users, given feedback from procurement so that our value proposition matches their reality and they can say, aha, looks good. So I will customize that economic value customer for each customer, and I will focus my sales effort where I'm actually adding more value, because that's a sustainable relationship. So how's that look? I said on average 50% was the um, period which a locomotive was used. I could imagine a long haul customer who's taking trains from Los Angeles to Savannah, Georgia on a regular basis, or Dallas, or Houston, or wherever they're going, that long haul customer is going to be using that train a whole lot more than 50% of the time. It'll be running day and night, almost continuously. So let's say that this customer says, on oh, our long hauls, we're using it 80% of the time. It's going to add a lot more value in fuel savings. That's a great calculation. I can show that economic value to the customer and say, you know, we're worth 
Mr. Customer, Mrs. Customer, we're worth $5 million to you. I'm only asking three. There's a lot of money on the table for you. Why not purchase? We'd expect that customer to close. In contrast, we have short haul customers. Maybe, maybe they're just doing small trips around a, a, an area and, and bringing people to the, to the uh, city and back and out to suburbs. So that short haul customer may not use the train as often. Perhaps they're only using it about 30% of the time. So now our fuel savings is much smaller. And you calculate the total economic value to the customer, and you realize your economic value to customer is below target, you just move on. You focus on the other people because that's where you're going to make the sale. Or you try to sell that customer a cheaper train because GE had the Evolution Series and their standard diesel locomotives. They can move on and sell that customer the standard GE diesel locomotive. We have details of how that calculation is working out. You see the 80% for the long haul, the 30% for the short haul, the rest of the numbers are the same. This is how we can actually calculate the economic value of the customer at a customer specific level. And you can put the whole picture together. I'm not gonna drag you through all of this calculation. Oops. There we go. Putting the whole picture together, we have for the long haul customer versus the short haul customer, you see the long haul customer, you're worth $6 million. You're only asking for 3.1. That's a good sale. Make it. The short haul customer, you're only worth three. And you're asking for 3.1. Let's move that short haul customer off to one of the lower priced diesel engines in our portfolio to be sold to them. Cool. Question mark, rock man. I'm glad you finally got it. What does this have to do with leverage point? All right. Excel, which is how I usually work, is great for making proof of concept. It's one off. It's fine for these one off situations. Problem is I have a sales force or you have a sales force, and you need to operationalize value-based selling across your entire sales force, across the organization. And that's going to require some processes and some routines. We, there's no reason to expect a salesperson to go through the math every time and do this kind of work, or to fully clarify what the value proposition is by working with product management until finally everything's nailed down or to do all that research to figure out all the parts of the value proposition and put a number on it and make a sale with the customer. The salesperson's managing that relationship. Let's not make their job more difficult. It's hard enough as it is. Let's accelerate their ability to manage those relationships and grow them. To do that, we need tools. We need tools and processes. And Leverage Point is the tool for operationalizing and coordinating value-based selling. So you can imagine, we're gonna stop there and say that again. Leverage Point is the tool for operationalizing and coordinating value-based selling. So we can imagine some sort of action plan that you can come up with. And in that action plan, first, somebody has to develop the economic value of the customer. The, 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 the really clarify what those differential benefits are and what your value proposition is. You cannot sell value if you don't know what it is. Somebody has to go through the hard work of clearly articulating that value proposition and clearly understanding how that value proposition changes with different kinds of customers, different kinds of segments, different kinds of markets. So someone has to develop the initial template economic value of the customer. Then we have to take that may have been done in Excel and PowerPoint, and we have to take it and put it in leverage point. And you might do it in Excel and PowerPoint because that's very flexible at the first, and it's easier to get people to come to an alignment in sharing PowerPoints, but that is not a good tool to spread across your entire organization. So we're gonna put that into leverage point. Maybe it's a super user or a pricing analyst or a sales support person. 
And then I'm going to take that leverage point output, which makes beautiful looking PDFs and has areas for customer, for salespeople to type in specific numbers. And I'm going to train salespeople on how to use it, maybe even do some role play and, and help them understand exactly how economic value of customer can be used in the sales cycle. Then I'm going to tell the salespeople how to customize it for every single sale. They'll customize the economic value of customer for each customer with the customer's data where it's relevant. Some parts are researched, so that's that. Other parts, let's get from the customer's viewpoint. Then I'm going to share, because I'm trying to create alignment among the buying team about what the value is of buying from me or you. I'm going to share that economic value to customer output with the customer for their consumption and creating alignment. Process, tools, value-based selling. Price execution is possible. It's realistic. It's achievable. You can do this. To get it done, what we have to do is clarify and communicate your value to each customer and create alignment within the buying group about that value. Because if that value is not perceived and acknowledged, that value does not exist for that customer. And if there is no value for that customer, you have a price buyer. Give them a de-featured low price solution. Treat them opportunistically. In the value-based pricing framework, we're really talking about price execution, capturing the value that you should be. Product management, we're creating product. We're creating value. And that value is created. But now we need to capture our fair share. One way to think about this, uh, some people call it a pricing playbook. Perfectly fine. You can take a look at your, your, your market. There's a natural market where you deliver value and they know you deliver value and they're going to buy from you every day. You, you can hold your price, try to close that sale. There's a competitive market where it's a value plier, buyer or as Reed Holden would call them, a poker player. They want the value, but they want to pretend they only care about the price. You're going to have a more mixed nuances on how to actually close that sale, but you still need to show the value. Then on the outside of that area, you have the opportunistic market where it's purely price buyers. In those cases, you're going to need to price above your floor or hopefully shift them into a lower price product that's more appropriate for them if you have that in your portfolio. There are cases when you may have excess inventory or low utilization, so you may go for pricing low just to utilize that, that plant. Or you may be anticipating a future shortage, in which case you may want to price high in anticipation that that shortage will drive customers to reach you because they can't get it anywhere else. Wiglaf, Toltec, Mesoamerican dude is trying to tell you, use the economic value to customer to clarify your value. Use leverage point to operationalize and coordinate this value communication across every customer in clear communication. It works. It really works. And that's the message I wanted to share with you today about pricing and value. You want to take it over? Great, thanks Tim for sharing your insights. We've had a few questions come in during the webinar and there's still time to enter your questions into the right hand panel on your screen. While you're entering, a quick reminder to complete the 10 second survey while exiting today's webinar to be entered into the raffle for a free copy of Pricing Done Right. Now, to give you a couple more minutes to enter your questions, a few quick words on Leverage Point. As Tim touched on earlier, we offer a SaaS solution that aligns pricing, product, marketing, and sales teams around creating, capturing, and communicating value. How does it work? Well, first, product mar marketing and pricing team members build custom branded value models and messages to create a value proposition that helps 
sales tell a story. They then publish that value proposition into a cloud-based library that's accessible by every rep at your organization to customize in real time for each customer's and prospect's needs. Finally, beginning with the first sales call, sales teams can modify the customer's baseline data in real time in order to create a unique business case to buy that the prospect can leverage internally to drive the deal forward. Early in the sales process, value propositions are extremely useful as flexible case studies and call prep, in building sales confidence, in qualifying opportunities, and in engaging customer executives. In the middle of the sales process, value propositions provide customer value analyses as an important consultative selling tool to address pre-sales challenges. In the purchase stage, the value proposition becomes a shared business case to buy, collaboratively agreed between sales executives and customer sponsors that serves as a buyer's internal just financial justification to purchase, as well as a sales team's asset in the price negotiation. Now, who wins? Value propositions and leverage point can be linked directly to an opportunity in Salesforce and can be downloaded into a PDF or PowerPoint at any time for a personalized lead behind. On average, our clients achieve a 5 to 15% higher close rate at 5%, 25% higher prices when using leverage point value props. And if you found any of that compelling, let us know in the post-webinar survey and we can schedule a custom demo for you and your team. Now for the questions and answers. Um, so we've got a bunch of comments. First of all, uh, this is always the most popular question. Yes, there will be, um, uh, the, yes, the slide will be available as well as the recording video after the webinar. So, um, so you'll, we'll be sure to send those out. That usually happens within 48 hours of the conclusion of this event. So the first question came in across the line. I see, um, how do you assess the right customer value sharing? Um, so I think what I think that means is um, how do you assess mm. the right split of value between the customer and yourself is what I'm taking. Yeah, so that's more of a price setting question than it is about value communication question. Uh, let's see here. The easiest way to show that is to jump to slide 30 if you can. Yeah, I can go and do that. And while you're doing it, I'll talk to the question. When you're Absolutely. doing these economic value to customers, the first thing you want to do is understand what the competing alternative is. So that becomes the first thing. You're because you know that that is the alternative, so you get that same piece of price to start with. That was the very first blue bar in this picture, okay? Or the two million dollars being listed in the table. We then have the positives and the negatives. Now there are, you add them up, that's roughly $2 million. And I said, okay, I'm gonna share a million. How did I come up with that million? I'll tell you. There are two sets of rules one can use. And uh, one of them is based upon behavioral economics. So it's theoretical. And behavioral economics says that if there's uh, $10 on the table, the customer's gonna want five of it and they'll give you five on average. Sometimes, according to real economic studies in the States, it's more like a 40-60 split. Customer's going to want 60 and they'll give you 40. Okay? That's the positive part. So that'd be, that would be applied to the fuel savings. Take a 50-50 split, that makes it about $1.5 million of fuel savings part. Just focusing on the differential value because that's the part that's at question. Then the maintenance cost is negative. Now, behavioral economics says that you feel pain twice as much as you feel gain. So every time I take away a dollar, you feel like I'm taking away $2 equivalent. It would take $2 to make it up to you if I took away $1 from you. So one could double that 800,000 and say it's about 1.6 million in losses, in which case your value to the customer is basically the same price as the competitor of, of uh, 2 million. Adding 1.5, subtracting 1.6, says I'm leaving you even 2 million. That rule comes directly out of behavioral economics and it's called the double gains, half, I'm sorry, double the pain, half the, half the gain. It's theoretical. While it has good scientific studies, it's not actually what's practiced and it is empirical, meaning we have shown, or it has been shown, but we have no reasons as to why it works. A different set of rules works better. 
and it's best called the 50-30-15 rule. Uh, you add the three million, you subtract off the 800,000, you got what, 2.2 million? Start your list price at 50% of that 2.2 million in differential value, that's 1.1. So 1.1 plus uh, 2 million, add at the $3 million price, which you're seeing there. That becomes your list price, that's 50%. 30% rule says that's what you expect. So your actual expected closing price would be 30% of that differential value. And the 15% is your walk away or your floor. So 15% of that uh, roughly 2 million, which would be 300,000, I'm trying to do math in my head, would be 300,000 plus the 2 million or 2.3 million is where you would just walk away from the deal and not close it. These, uh, that 50, 30, 15% rule, it's often stated by any of your major consulting firms I have to name my competitors? Yes, okay, fine. McKenzie, BCG, Bain, we don't actually compete, different kinds of customers we serve. They will all tell you that rule and say, why? Oh, from our millions of years of experience. And you're like, do you have any studies? Did you write anything? No, no studies written. I can't find it documented anywhere, but they'll all say it's true. I've tested it out with a few uh, procurement agents. They pretty much have the same expectations. So then again, maybe McKinsey, Bain, and BCG is telling both sides the same thing. Anyway, that seems to work empirically. That's what the market expects. List price at 50% of the differential value plus the price of the alternative. Closing price at 30% of your differential value plus the price of the alternative. Walk away or floor price at 15% of the differential value plus the price of the alternative. That's a long-winded explanation, huh? Sorry yeah, about that. some great, some great mental math too. Um, so we'll uh, <laughs> see if this one's a little less mathy. Uh, so, do you have any advice uh, when you have different roles, say procurement or economic buyers? Um, what would be your advice for customizing the conversation for each of those different specific stakeholders? Can you jump to slide seventeen and I'll do. get started on it? Um, so. End users are going to be the ones, the one, the yellow ones are going to be the customer, are going to be the members of your buying committee that are going to best know the situation, and they would probably be. I've been in cases where the end user was an engineer, and if you show them a spreadsheet, they're like, "Oh, let me play." So you show them what it is you're trying to calculate, and you say, "No, I, I, I don't, I don't know what the number is. This is just a." Average number for customer. I don't know what it is for your for your situation. So, like, imagine your ADP dealer services, and you're managing uh, service bay utilization of car dealerships. I don't know how many car repair bays you have. On average, car dealerships may have five. You may have fifteen. You may have two. I don't know. Just put in the number. Tell me the number. These are non-objective. Uh, uh, objectionable numbers. And the end user will also tell you what kind of values they see as pertinent or non-pertinent. I remember when I was selling uh, when I was selling automatic meter reading solutions, and I went to one territory. They weren't really worried about getting the meter read or the savings of the meter read, but they were worried about uh, the outages, knowing when there's an outage. It was in rural America. And it's kind of hard to tell if a farm is out of power when nobody visits that house for a month. Maybe it's a vacation home or something of that nature. Or when you have a pumping station, if it goes out of power, the crops don't get watered and they all die. That's absolutely atrocious for our farming community. But you don't have anybody there monitoring the pumping station and the power. So they were very worried about outages. They weren't worried about savings costs of meter reads. Meanwhile, I live in Chicago, cost of meter reading is actually expensive. So it's different concerns, and the end user can help you understand those concerns. Great. Those concerns uh, are probably... Sorry. I'm, going. I'm going to keep going. Those concerns okay. are going to be uh, probably part of the scoring mechanism within the procurement. So we need to understand how we stack up and how those, those concerns and our value add impacts our score in procurement. Procurement needs to know 
what's important, where the value is. And the economic buyer, they'd like to see the whole picture. Now notice I've kind of left out the support, the gatekeeper. I may or may not include the influencer. The visionary may want to see the high picture, but not the details. Don't talk to the competitors. Everybody knows that. And the screener, they just screened you. They're done. Does that help you out? Now, that yeah, was a long-winded answer. I think that uh, and it's, a, it's a comprehensive one. Um, this one, I think you touched on later in the presentation, but I think it's a good one. Um, how do you determine the, how does sales team specifically determine the difference between a price buyer and a value buyer? Um, and is there a way to move someone from one to the other? Okay, that uh, move one from one place to the other, uh, Reed Holt, I kind of know if they're a price buyer, that's, they've kind of told you, they're just buying the cheap thing. I, I remember when I used to sell shoes, and yeah, we're slide 13. When I used to sell shoes, uh, the the uh, there were people, men, I couldn't sell women's shoes. They make no sense to me. But the men would come to me, they'd ask for the cheap pair of shoes. Cool, I'll bring them out, their pet size, size 10 and a half D and a wingtip. That's what they wanted, cheap Dexters, got it. At the same time, I'd bring out the Johnson Murphy. Same style, wingtip, black, 10 and a half D. And I'd let that customer put on the cheap thing they wanted and say, would you like to just try this other one, the Johnson Murphy? And about half the time, the men would actually say, wow, I can stand all day in a pair of Johnson and Murphys. These Dexters, they look nice. I'll go to church in them, but I'm not going to stand on the trade floor. I'm, this doesn't make sense for a selling salesperson or for somebody who actually has to go to work and walk in them all the time. Now, that price buyer who's just buying a cheap shoe for special occasions is not going to trade, did not trade up very often. Got it. The other people simply didn't know the value of buying a better shoe. And that was 20 years ago. Now, you know, there's much better shoes one can purchase. Probably back then there were as well. But I was young, and those were the only two shoes I knew. You're going to identify them pretty clearly on what they say they want. If you need more details, read, read, uh, read Negotiating with Backbone. All right. Great. Um, so this one's another interesting one. So when you look at good team efforts and selling value, uh, how do you look at different, I guess, commercial team roles? Um, who comes up with the initial value quantification um, and how do they work with different members of the team? So I think uh, oh. who, who come, who, who's responsible? That's great. Go back down to slide 36 if you can. All right, moving on over. I'm just making you jump around now, aren't I, Nick? No, oh, getting a workout. <laughs> so somebody has to create the initial economic value to a customer. I find that to be a one to two month process or weeks is my go-to answer, but sometimes coordination makes it take longer and we have challenges. Somebody has to do that. And that would be somebody who's very mathematical and I'm not going to say exactly what title they have. Uh, very mathematical, very market oriented and, and, and working with product management usually. Usually it's product management in detail to come up with that value proposition. And then, then after working with product management in detail on that particular product, then expanding it out to include the commercial team commercial team lead and the finance team and the finance team lead so that they all agree on the value proposition and the value you're creating for the customer. That's one step and that's work. Somebody has to do this. Now, some teams, I know of a software team north of here in Milwaukee that has a internal resources dedicated to doing nothing but creating economic value to customer. Cool. That's a great team. They have a great opportunity up there. I keep pointing north. No one can see that I'm pointing north. That's where Milwaukee is. Okay, so that's one team. The next thing is I got to put it in the leverage point. Anyone can. Anyone who's trained in leverage point can do that. Usually, the person who creates the economic value customer will do it into leverage point. Uh, 
I'll, I'll have a secret for you, uh, Nick. I, when I need it done, I just ask you all to do it. And because <laughs> I'm trying to show a customer how it works and you're welcoming you into the sales opportunity. But anyway, it can get done by someone. Then I got a sales train. Uh, I got to train the, the, I've been on a team where you had a technical salesperson who actually understood the technology and how it all works and was in charge with explaining exactly how things would work. And then uh, there was the relationship development person who's out there hunting for areas where you have a problem. And then the executive sales person whose job was to close, whose job was to clarify that value proposition. Now, the input for that uh, value model would probably come from both the technical salesperson heavily, more heavily upon the relationship manager who's out there detecting and hunting for opportunities. But it's the executive salesperson who's responsible for putting the picture together and determining how to, what to include, what to strip out, how to position the, the information. Now, when they're positioning the information, you know, Again, some of the data comes directly from that customer. Cool. Other, other of the data is researched. So you may need to actually position as to why this is a definitive truth or a representative understanding of what, what reality is. And that, that may require other documentation or statements about the studies that were done to support that claim. But you have to claim the value. You don't want to argue with the customers about certain things. You just say, this is our understanding. If you want to change that number, go ahead. And if their changing of that number says that there's no value, then say, great, I'm selling you the wrong thing. Let me sell you something cheaper. Let me sell you something else. They just revealed that they're a price buyer. But it's a way of managing the entire sales cycle in a very complex selling situation. Great. And I think um, we have time for one more. And, uh... We've got a bunch of questions here, but this one I think is pretty closely related to the last one. Um, so where in the sales cycle do you raise value? You mentioned a bunch of the different sales executives and roles. Um, and so where in that process should you raise it? Early and often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how else to answer that one. Uh, I mean, it, it, the whole point of the relationship is for value exchange. Might as well ask upfront, what is it you're after? Yes, okay, fine. You're after a beautiful looking calamity mug. Ta da, there's a calamity mug if you can see the picture. Okay, well, cool. And why? <laughs> what was your purpose? Because it's cool. Okay, great. Our price for calamity mugs are 60 bucks per set. Will you take a calamity mug? Yes or no? There we go. Well, um, well, that, that's a great way to end it. So um, thank you, um, for Tim, for your presentation today. And one quick note before we go, and I'm going to slide through our slides. Uh, next month's webinar, we're, um, we're, make sure you pre-register in the exit survey. Uh, we're going to be joined by Mike Wilkinson. Uh, he's a repeat presenter. And we're really excited about this one. He's going to be talking about ways to consistently win in competitive scenarios where you have a superior product um, using value selling. So uh, make sure you sign up in the exit survey. And that's it from us today. So thank you everyone for taking the time to join us. A special thank you for Tim for sharing his insights. And from all of us here at Leverage Point, have a wonderful uh, rest of your week. Take care.